Welcome back to Tipping Point. I'm your host, Kara McKinney. Joe Biden is committing you, dear taxpayer, to paying for the full cost of rebuilding the Francis Scott Key Bridge in Baltimore, Maryland. I guess he's not even going to wait to see how much insurance can cover or how much the state and local governments have on hand for disaster recovery. Obviously, he doesn't want another East Palestine mess on his hands right before November, so he wants Americans to know that Joe, well, Joe will get it done. Literally saying during a White House press conference that we're not leaving until this job gets done. And when Joe says he'll get it done, well, he means at your expense, and most likely overpriced and way over schedule, if any past government project is something to go off of. As always, it turns out that this cargo ship, the Dolly, had been involved in a prior incident back in 2016 when it hit a stone loading pier in the port of Antwerp, Belgium. Subsequent inspections, one even as recent as last year, came back showing deficiencies when it came to structural conditions like damage to the hull, impairing seaworthiness, as well as deficiencies with the propulsion and auxiliary machinery of the vessel, meaning the gauges, thermometers, and other similar devices on board. There is that incompetency crisis for you that we were talking about last night. At least when the crew realized they were losing power, they were able to signal a mayday alert that allowed authorities to block off traffic to the bridge, saving countless lives. Though, of course, our thoughts and prayers are with the six construction crew members who were on the bridge as it collapsed and who are now assumed to be deceased. And just to rub even more salt in the wound, the Associated Press is essentially asking its readers to question the namesake historical figure behind the bridge in the first place, arguing, quote, his personal history has made him a controversial figure in some quarters. In June 2020, a statue of him in San Francisco was taken down, end quote. Our friend Jeremy Carl of the Claremont Institute called it yesterday when he posted, quote, minor point amidst the tragedy, but if you think the new bridge is going to be named after a slave owner, who, who cares that he wrote the Star Spangled Banner, but Francis Scott Key, I have the remains of the Key Bridge to sell you. Kwaisi Fume Bridge, here we come. And yes, Fume is a real guy. He's a Democrat representing the 7th Congressional District of Maryland in the U.S. House of Representatives, so that could easily be a real possibility. But before we get into the interview tonight, allow me to point out a few other fun historical pieces of trivia. Francis Scott Key may have owned a few slaves during his lifetime, but he actually argued against the peculiar, peculiar institution during a case before the Supreme Court. He also successfully defended Aaron Burr's co-conspirators against treason charges. The Washington Post, back in the good old pre-woke days of 1987, wrote, quote, Key got a reputation for emphasizing style over legal substance, but in Washington, style can go a long way. A congressman accused Sam Houston of defrauding the government. Houston, in turn, caned the congressman, and the House of Representatives dragged him to trial. Key defended Houston and attacked not so much the Congress as the press, which had portrayed Houston as a brute. Not so, cried Key, insisting that Houston had once indeed an arm fit to execute the strong impulses of a brave heart, but that arm he had given to his country. On the field of one of her most perilous battles, it had been raised in her defense. Key's defense changed Houston from bully to crippled vet, and Congress let him off with a reprimand. Key's performance impressed Houston's buddy, President Andrew Jackson, who appointed Key U.S. Attorney for Washington. Key promptly set about closing down the gambling dens that lined Pennsylvania Avenue, end quote. Now, I don't know if anyone remembers the historical spotlight I did on that Houston case a while back, but it was a fun one. It was a wild ride. Anyway, joining us now to discuss all this and more is military defense attorney Davis Yon. Davis, thanks for being here tonight. Hey, good evening. Great. So any bets on if the bridge will be renamed? <laughs> oh, I bet a lot of money on it being named anything other than uh, its current name. You know, even in France, remember when the Notre Dame Cathedral burned down, there was thoughts at first, right? And in France, they said, maybe we could just take this opportunity to completely destroy it in a sense. They're going to rebuild it back into some modern looking, hideous type. But they were going to have maybe pools on the roof and make it all glass. I mean, very, very strange ideas. But, you know, the Associated Press saying, well, you do know Francis Scott Key, even though he, he wrote the Star Spangled Banner, his, some of his statues were torn down in 2020. So, Okay, yeah, great. Like, let's listen to those writers, right, of 2020. It seems that they've cast a really long shadow, would you say? Yeah, I would absolutely agree. And, you know, Francis Scott Key is an important part of our history. No one's perfect. None of our founders were perfect. They were human beings with flawed. But this is someone who gave us a huge and important part of our tradition as a nation. And he was absolutely a colorful figure, a very successful attorney who was involved in very significant legal battles and so all in all, he was a man of his times who was highly successful and very influential in our nation.
That he was, and of course now Biden, he knows how things didn't look too good for him after East Palestine when he refused to go down there, made up excuses as to why he couldn't. A, a lot of local people were, a lot of local residents were left in a lurch when you have toxic plumes above you and then chemicals leaking into your water below you and everyone's trying to tell you everything's okay. So it seems with this collapse of the bridge and of course the you know huge impact it's having on the economy, on transportation, on supply chains and the like, he wants to you know show that you know Joe can get it done. And, and it's hard to even say that without laughing because, well, I mean, look at his track record. But do you think that's why he's committing even more taxpayer dollars when we are trillions and trillions and trillions in debt? He just signed another $1.2 trillion whopper over the weekend. He, you know, he's giving all this money out to the blue cities and sanctuary cities that claim we love open borders. Now they're struggling o under open borders and he's giving them all this money. So where is this money going to be coming from? I'm, I'm pretty sure we don't have to cover the entire cost of it. I'm sure the state insurance companies can handle some of it. Yeah, I mean, this this feels very much like just sort of blank political posturing without a lot behind it. We know if the federal government's involved doing the federal contracting on this, it's going to take longer. It's going to cost more. It's going to be more complicated than it than it should be. Now, I understand the scale is very different, but look at the state of Florida and Governor DeSantis when they had a bridge that was destroyed by the hurricane that completely cut off the people that lived on an island. Again, smaller bridge, different scenario, but it took the state of Florida the hours to rebuild that bridge, right? And again, this is a larger scale product, but the issue is the federal government coming in to help with a project like this, to spend taxpayer money that we don't have, they're gonna have to print money to do this, and it's not going to make it happen faster. It's going to be much more complicated, but they don't really have a choice. I mean, the larger issue here with this bridge collapse is it just identifies a serious national security risk that we have in our nation because of our failing infrastructure, but also the supply chain. I mean, the big concern here is this losing this port for any period of time has a huge disruption and impact on our supply chain because of our bloated government, because of our taxes and regulation. Companies can't afford to manufacture these products in the United States anymore, and that creates a national security threat. So all of the problems, the collateral impacts of this, it's not just the absurdity of, of how we're gonna pay for it and how it's gonna take longer if the federal government's doing this, is the policies that Biden has continued to force that Obama did before him with regard to manufacturing and our bloated government and regulations has created a supply chain crisis. So one bridge, taking out one bridge at one port in our nation creates a serious risk to the supply chain. That's the kind of thing we should be understanding when we look at this. That's the larger issue here. We should not be so vulnerable. Unfortunately, we are. That, no, that's really smart analysis of the situation, you know, and, you know, as, you know, Biden's trying to, sh you know, shine up his image, I guess, before November by trying to tackle this and trying to pretend that now he's Mr. Strong Borders, which is just the funniest thing ever in the entire world. Uh, but also another big issue that's really going to be hurting Democrats this November is, of course, crime, right? Crime is a major issue. And New York City just had another horrific, horrific stabbing. It was a fatal stabbing of an officer, an NYPD officer. Officer. Uh, he just goes to check up on this car that was illegally parked, you know, just wants to ask the, the two people sitting in the car a couple of questions. The guy sitting in the passenger seat, well, you know, he wasn't too happy about that. The man, it appears now, has been arrested 21 times in the past. His last stint, I think, in prison was about five years. He went, I think, he got out in 2021, but 21 prior arrests, and yet he's still out here walking and breathing our same air instead of being locked away somewhere. And, of course, he gets mad. They start firing at the cops and this NYPD officer is killed. Turns out the NYPD officer, he's a faithful Christian, devoted Catholic. His young child that he leaves behind, he leaves behind, of course, a wife and a child. The little baby, they actually, you know, put a picture on social media of the child with a this little you know shirt saying my dad's life mattered too and i think that was very profound but now they're saying with the the alleged shooter in this case they he had to be taken to the hospital because he was shot too and it turns out he had a, like a four inch shiv in his you know guts because he basically went out that night knowing he was going to go to jail because he was up to something he's not saying exactly what he and his buddy were up to and what exactly they were going to be doing illegally that night but there was definitely something and he thought he was going back to jail for i guess the 22nd time so he even had a knife stuffed up his rectum for in case that happened and you know sally didn't want to do that and so he ended up taking an officer's life instead as is alleged but i mean isn't this maybe something biden could at least at least when he's, you know, trying to be Mr. Fake Santa Claus here and trying to pretend to care about all these issues happening under his watch. But maybe is this something he should be giving some airtime to and some oxygen to? 
Well, he should be talking about it. And what he should be talking about is the fact that in cities like New York and Chicago and other places, our criminal justice system is absolutely broken and failing. We have Soros-funded DAs that have come into these offices. They are implementing Marxist principles, progressive ideology. And, and the result of that is we've, our government has abandoned its primary biblical duty, which is to protect the innocent and punish the wicked. And our cities are not doing that. Across the country, our states are not doing that because of these source-funded DAs that don't have our best interests in mind. So what you're seeing, this is another reflection of the fact that the criminal justice system in New York is absolutely failing. And if you look into it and you study it, you'll hear the mayor of New York talking about, well, we have a real problem with our system being overwhelmed and we have backlogs. We're having to dismiss cases because of speedy trial issues. Well, perhaps if the DA in New York, Alvin Bragg, spent less time going after his political enemies like Donald Trump and the attorney general in New York spent less time going after political enemies like Donald Trump, they would actually have time to prosecute real criminals like this that are a real and present danger to the citizens of New York and police officers. And because of those failed policies, a husband and a father has been killed. And there's it, it stops being something that we can continue to take excuses for. It's obvious. It's a fundamental failing of, of morality. It's a fundamental abandonment of biblical principles and true ideas of justice. But we've invited in these Soros-funded DAs, and we are paying the consequences. That we are. And I think even RFK Jr., right, he was courting some people on the right, and now his new VP pick. It seems that she has spent a lot of money, you know, supporting those Soros Bank DA type causes. So, you know, I guess, well, now the only good thing with that is he'll be a spoiler and he's going to hurt Biden a lot more, but, you know, by going after the more progressive angle. But last headline I want to get with to you, t with, you know, with you tonight is, you know, going back to the border situation, we have a, a situation in Michigan, Grand Rapids area, in which a young woman, I think about 25 years old, was found deceased next to the side of a highway out there, shot multiple times. It turns out she may have been in a romantic relationship with a man who was here in the U.S., illegally. The man had a long criminal rap sheet once again, breaking into cars, driving drunk, um, just the whole spiel driving multiple times without a, a proper license. And then here's the kicker, though. He was actually deported under the Trump administration. Under President Trump, he had been deported. He got back in under Biden. And then under Biden, he has stayed. And so once again, we have another Lake and Riley type situation. I know it wasn't just an outright attack on a random woman, like in Riley's case. It seems that there was a romantic relationship. But I mean, still, last minute or so on the clock for any of your thoughts. Yeah, I mean, every single time we have an illegal immigrant that commits a violent crime like this, it's a tragedy and it's an avoidable tragedy. The White House, the current administration is continuing to encourage mass illegal immigration and the system is being overwhelmed. So again, every single one of these, it's not the majority of crimes that occur in the United States, but every single one of them would be avoidable if our government was serious about protecting its citizens and securing our border. And that's what makes the sting on these cases so much worse, because, of course, we have homegrown murderers, right? I hate when the left set says that, well, you know, there's Americans who murder, too. Like, wow, I never thought of that. So let's just compound the problem by adding even more people. And like you said, in situations that never had to have existed, if these people were not allowed in in the first place or were deported on their first, you know, stepping that pinky toe over our line. But, you know, that's the I guess that's the left's what they think is a winning message. I don't know, because I think it's failing a lot right now. Uh, but Davis, thanks for joining us tonight. Thank you. God bless.